In this, our fourth session on the topic of holiness, we're going to look at what we might call the dynamics of holiness. In our last session, we looked at the human person. What kind of creature is the human person? What kind of creature is the human person that he could be elevated to being a child of God, and therefore what we call being divinized? Now, we're going to look at how does that man or woman become divinized in practice, not kind of in theory. How does this happen or not happen, as the case may be? Now, the first thing we have to point out, and in a way it's kind of obvious, is that when a person is elevated, for example, in baptism, the moment that they receive this, what we call sanctifying grace, well, that is only the very beginning. It doesn't end there. What has happened there, their elevation, for example, through baptism, has to be worked out in their life. And it has to give rise to fruits, the fruits of holiness, which are shown in the way we think, in the way that we act, in the way that we speak, that all these things are reflecting a good and holy source. Just as our Lord says in the gospel, by their fruits, you will know them. By the fruits, you know what kind of tree it is. So the same with us, by holy actions and holy thoughts and holy words, we realize that the tree, the source, the person is holy. So again, it is not just enough to have been baptized to receive sanctifying grace, but rather the natural fruit of that, the natural expression of that are the good works, these holy works. And of course, this all has to be done freely. And this is a big theme. Freedom is a big theme. What does freedom mean? It means that you and I are really in charge of our destiny. Ultimately, we freely embrace or not holiness, and therefore we embrace the fruits of holiness. We're not forced. We don't do this because we have been forced to by fear or threats or so on, but rather because we see that this is really good. We understand this is really good and I want what is good. Now, there's kind of justifiable fear. For example, uh, it's pretty justifiable for us to feel afraid of doing things that would lead us to hell. So sure, fear does have a role to play sometimes, but you could kind of say it's an emergency measure. It's like the stick that sometimes have to be threatened with. We have to threaten ourselves perhaps to keep ourselves on the straight and narrow, but it shouldn't be our main motivation because our, our real, our dominant motivation has to be love, the love of what is good. Ultimately, the person who is good in himself, that is God, not fear of God, but love of God. For that reason, freedom is a big part of our dignity, that we can do things because I want to, not out of fear, but because personally, I really want what is good. For example, I do not want to be a slave to my passions. I want to pursue what is good freely. And it's, that's, that's a big theme with us. I shouldn't limit my motivation to, I'm not doing this because I don't want to go to hell. Again, as I was saying earlier, sometimes that's, yeah, sure, that is a motivation. In fact, because you're feeling so weak, the stick is the only thing that will stop me from doing this. But that shouldn't be the dominant or the enduring or the principal motivation that we normally have. Rather, I want to do this good thing because it is good. I see that with my intelligence and I embrace it with all my freedom. And that's where conscience comes in. Conscience is often very badly understood. Conscience is precisely what allows us to see that goodness, that essential ingredient, the goodness of something, or the lack of goodness, in a very concrete action that's kind of right in front of us. Something that we're about to do, or something that we did in the past, or there's something we're in the process of, do, of actually doing at the moment. And our conscience is that part of our, essentially our intelligence, which is able to identify for us, this is good, or this is not good. That's really what allows us to be free. Without conscience, we would never be free. It is telling me, my conscience is telling me, it tells you, well, really, that thing that you're doing is not good, or it is good. So it's a voice, a judgment, telling us about the moral quality in practice of an action. And, and therefore, it really is a very sacred thing. Vatican II put it very nicely, talking about it being a law inscribed or carved by God in our hearts. And our, our, our conscience is man's most secret core and his sanctuary. Only you and God can see your conscience. No other human being can see into your conscience. And in a certain sense, 
Your conscience is where you are in dialogue with God, where God is telling you what is good and evil, and we are responding freely. God's eternal law about what is right and wrong, his eternal plan is written into creation and it speaks to our conscience. So for example, you were with another person, for example, another person of the opposite sex, and our conscience, if it's working correctly, because sometimes it's not working correctly, it allows us to see that I have to treat this person in a certain way. I have to treat them in accordance with their dignity and so on. And that law is written into your, into your very heart and written into the nature of another human being also. And it doesn't take faith to recognize this. Cicero, who lived se several decades before Christ, he has written amazing things about conscience, saying that this law, the natural law, we call it now, is a universal law. There's not one law in Rome and another in law in Athens. It's a universal law of justice. And if we break it, he actually says that to break that law is a very serious thing, that a person who offends against this natural moral law he says, must endure the most severe penalties hereafter, in the afterlife, even if he avoids the usual misfortunes in the present life. And you, when you hear that, you say, well, that must have been written by a Christian. No, it's written by a pagan Cicero. Very good one, very good man, but just shows you this is very universal. So anyway, there is some ideas, there's much, much more we can say with very only a very brief time. But anyway, there's some little ideas about the conscience recognizing this God-given law, a law written into creation and written into our hearts and our minds. I give you thanks, my God, for the good resolutions, affections and inspirations you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you for help to put them into effect. My Mother Immaculate, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.